Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Sigmund, and I'm sharing with you this morning. I want to introduce myself because I don't work here, um, and I don't know all of you. I am married to my husband, Jonathan, who does work here. He's the executive pastor. We have two kids. There's some pictures. Our kids are in kindergarten and second grade at the elementary school uh, right up the road. I teach third grade. I've been a public school teacher for 14 years. I love my job. Um, I cook, I read, not that interesting. Um, my kids refer to this as teaching the grown-up class. Sometimes mommy teaches pre-K, kindergarten, sometimes mommy teaches first and second grade, and sometimes mommy teaches the grown-up class. So I get to teach the grown-up class today, um, not because I have a fancy degree in God, but because I really love Jesus and I love the Bible. So I get to teach you today, thanks. Um, like I said, I am a public school teacher. I, um, around 12, realized that my talents included reading and telling people what to do. So it was a really clear career track for me. But I went to a liberal arts college, which means that like, in addition to my teacher education courses, I had to take a lot of general educations. I had to take science credits, I had to take music credits, I had to take golf, that went badly. Um, I had to take a couple painful math credits, but one of the required credits was philosophy, philosophy and ethics. And I had this lovely professor and he would start every class with a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. Apparently the um, creator of Calvin and Hobbes had a background in philosophy. And I loved those couple minutes of Calvin and Hobbes because it was the only minutes of the class that I either enjoyed or understood. <laughs> but I do remember from learning the different philosophies, and we studied from the ancient world all the way up to current times, and the way that philosophies were ways of thinking that gave you a system for understanding what was happening around you and gave you a way to identify what is good and what is evil. And a lot of people think that Christianity is a philosophy. It's the way that we make sense of the world around us, or it's the, the rules we use to identify good and evil and out of bounds. But it's actually not that at all. A philosophy is kind of like when you frame out a house. It's a set of ideas that you set up in the shape you like that helps you understand the world. Faith is me believing in someone else. There's a different being involved. It's not me structuring my thoughts the way that I think makes sense. It's me saying there is someone else here. In this case, a creator. And I'm going to live my life in relation to that being. That's why faith and philosophy are not the same thing. So when you start a life of faith, and you're growing trying to understand how to follow God, the first question that will smack you in the face is what is God like then? If he's real and if he made this, what is he actually like? And then after that, how does he relate to me? What does he want from me? And where do you even get an answer to a question like that? So if we're talking about the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God is like God's presence in our world, how we can experience God without even being able to see him or hear him. But when I want to know what someone is like, I talk to them and they talk back to me and I can see you and that's not how it works because we are flesh and God is spirit. So where do we get answers for what God is like if we can't speak to him like we speak to each other. And people answer that question in a lot of different ways. Every culture re-answers that question every 50 years based on what the trending thoughts and opinions are of that generation in that culture. There'll be like almost a cultural explanation. Oh, God's kind of like this. Um, some people essentially decide what they want the answer to be. I want God to think these things and then they take that on as their belief. That has not worked for me in parenting. I want you to be like this, no. So best of luck if you're taking that attitude to the divine. But most of us, most of us answer the question of what is God like 
as collecting a whole bunch of experiences, things we experienced as a kid, um, sound bites we heard on the radio or from television where people who sounded like they knew were gonna tell us what God is like. And most of us do what people do growing up. We took all those opinions and we collect, connected the dots as best we could to form an opinion of what God is like. When I was growing up, I went to a great church, um, but their worship section, the music, was a lot more demonstrative. And, and sometimes things would happen in church that were very confusing to me. And they didn't make sense in my mind. And it was very unpredictable. So I couldn't understand what was happening and I didn't know when it was coming. And an adult at one point explained to me that that was a move of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit had caused that event. So I connected the dots and went into adulthood thinking that the Holy Spirit was kind of like, you know that um, Christmas movie where the Griswold family plug in the lights and the, the house lights up? And then out of nowhere, Cousin Eddie shows up. And you didn't know Cousin Eddie was coming. And once he got there, everything got weirder. That was my understanding of the Holy Spirit coming into adulthood. You do not know when he's coming and he will make things weird. And so I was not terribly interested. But the work of being an adult Christian is to take the ideas that we formed about God and to take those ideas and carry them right back to the Bible and say, is that how Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit? Is that how Jesus taught about the presence of God on earth? Is that the way, because the Bible spans thousands of years, is that the way for thousands of years God has been revealing his presence in our world? I think that's just the work of being a grown-up who follows Jesus, taking all your ideas and bringing them back to scripture. So we're actually gonna look at two different passages today when we're looking at these questions of what is God like and how do I relate to him? The first one comes from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel um, was written by Ezekiel, named the book after himself. He was occupationally a priest and a prophet, which means that in their culture, he functioned as the communicator between the Holy Spirit of God and the people who were trying to follow God. At the specific time that this book was written, he was writing it to the people of Judah who had been exiled. Because remember, we're in ancient culture. So their area had been conquered and they had been exiled to live in a different place in Babylon. This book was written um, in the 500s BC. So remember, we're counting down. So we're like five, 600 years before the birth of Christ. And the people who were reading this, who Ezekiel was talking to, were experiencing not just a forced displacement and homelessness and to live in an area where you don't understand the language and you, it's not your culture, it's not your food. But in their lived experience, they believed that the presence of God was in the temple in Jerusalem. They thought that that's where the Holy Spirit was. So they thought that when they lost their temple, when they lost their home, they had lost the guiding Holy Spirit of God. But God, being spirit, does not live in a church in Jerusalem. And he was not stuck in the building. And he comes to them where they are in Babylon with this message through Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel is recorded as um, a book of visions. And spiritual visions sound very mystical and freaky and woo-woo, and they are not. It's really, it's really just that we learn better when there's a visual attached. We hold better to concepts when there's a picture that goes with it. That's why your textbook companies included color pictures and diagrams. They did not want to pay for the color ink. They just knew that people would learn it better, remember it better, connect to it better when there's a visual. So a lot of the visions in the book of Ezekiel are visuals to help us understand who God is and what he was doing. So what we're reading here, if you wanna look in your Bible or your phone, it's up to you. It'll also be on the screen but it's in Ezekiel chapter seven, nope, 11, those rhyme. It's in Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 16 to 20. Therefore say, thus says the Lord, so this is God speaking, 
Though I removed them far off among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary for them for a while in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, thus says the Lord, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come there, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. So when I go to a passage like that and I'm trying to pull out information about what God is like, I look at what God does because that's how we find out what someone is like. I could tell you, my friend Sue is so thoughtful and you'd be like, isn't that nice? Or I could tell you about things she does. I could tell you that when my daughter had an ear infection and I was out of school for two days and I went back in expecting chaos and piles of papers. I opened my classroom and my friend Sue from down the hall had graded all of my students' papers for the last 48 hours and they were stacked in neat piles on my reading table and there was a bouquet of fresh flowers. And now you think Sue is thoughtful because we, we know who people are by what they do. Talk is cheap. So we go to a passage like this and I pull out the, the verb phrases. What does God do? What does he say he does? And that's how I find out what he is like. Let me read you just the verb passages. I always do parts of speech when I speak, I apologize. Old habits die hard. Says the Lord God, that's in there, because God speaks because he's not a set of ideas. He's an actual being and he speaks. These are his words. I scattered them. In the passage, he says, he's the one who caused them to scatter. You know, this time in history came after essentially a rebellion period for the people of Judah and they had not been following God. And this was God allowed the natural consequence of their action. If you do not think natural consequences are a loving thing, you do not teach in a public school. And then he says, I will be a sanctuary to them. That's one of my favorites. That's God saying, I will be a sanctuary to them. Sanctuary used to like, you know, on the east side, the bird sanctuary that you can go visit, wild wings. It's a safe place. It's a protected place where the dangers are not able to hurt you. God is the sanctuary to them. That's what he says he is, so that's, that's who he is. This is all answering the question, what is God like? It says, I will gather you and assemble you. That's the bringing together of people in a cultural crisis of loneliness. It's God saying that what he does is he brings people together and he assembles them and he gathers them. He says, I will give you the land, I will give them one heart, a new spirit I will put within them. I will give them a heart of, remove their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. It's, it's God's Holy Spirit that can reach into the place that is rock hard because you believe it has to be to protect yourself, that can remove that, that can put back in a soft and tender heart that can be open to life again. That's what God does. So that's who he is. And then I will be their God. And you see when you do this, when you take these questions about what God is like to passages of scripture from Genesis to the end of Revelation, you see the same themes because the character of God doesn't change. He's not like us. I'm different than I was 10 years ago. I know there's people who are really hoping I'm gonna be a little different in 10 years. But the character of God doesn't change. So when I see something in the way he spoke to the people in exile, that's who he is. That's who he was in Ezekiel's time and that's who he is now. The Bible is full of passages like this that show us what God is like. 
And so when you are learning this and you're growing in this, which we do until we die, um, we get to the question of like, okay, if that's what God is like, and he's this other being, what does he want from me? What does he think of me? How is this gonna work? It's like when you were young and you were dating and you, ha like you got to know the other person, but there was always that other part of like, what do they think of me? How will this work? I found that exhausting. I told my husband, you have to take your vitamins, you can't die, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> that was rough. But then once we look at the character of God and how beautiful and, and different from us he is, we want to build that connection so that I can relate to the Holy Spirit of God. And how does that work? And the Bible is completely full of passages about that. The next one we're gonna read is from the book of Romans. So we're actually gonna fast forward 600 years-ish, which is great because it demonstrates that God himself does not change with time. Cultures have changed, peoples have changed, beliefs have changed, but God doesn't change. So the section we're reading today is from the book of Romans. It was a letter that was written by Paul to a church to be read aloud, which is exactly what I'm gonna do now, 2,000 years later. Now God doesn't change, but the nature of how we relate to God changed after the cross. And this passage comes after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, there's this great section in the Bible where it says that when Jesus died, the temple curtain was ripped from the top to the bottom. And the curtain in the temple signified, this is the presence of God, this is the Holy Spirit presence of God on earth, and this is where the people can stand. And when Jesus died, the, the curtain ripped from the top to the bottom. So God's spirit did not change, but the way that we could relate to him did. And what we're gonna read now in the book of Romans is Paul explaining to the people how that relationship between us and the Holy Spirit works. Look at the language in it. This is Romans chapter eight, verses 14 to 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So taking that question of how does the Holy Spirit of God relate to me, back to that passage to get my information, here's what I see adopted child. That's a family relationship. Verse 14 says that those who are led by the Spirit of God, that means that there is leading and guidance available to me through that relationship, that the Holy Spirit of God can lead me. That there's freedom from slavery and fear in a culture that makes a lot of money every year on fear that that's not a guaranteed reality for you, that there is freedom from that as you relate to the Holy Spirit. In verse 16, it says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You know that horrible feeling when you're in a room and you just don't think there's space for you? Like you don't belong anywhere? This is, this is the opposite of that. It's the Holy Spirit who comes and assures you that you belong here, that you are the child of God. And then I left verse 17 in there, even though it's not as cheerful, because it says that we suffer with him. It says that when you're suffering, the Holy Spirit is your company. He's the one next to you. So if that's who the Holy Spirit is, if he, if he is all of these things we've talked about, and this is how he can relate to us. The other thing about Christianity being um, two people, us and God, not just an idea, is that I, ha I have to make some kind of response. There's two people involved here. So if this is who the Holy Spirit is, and this is the relationship available to me, I choose whether or not I want it. We decide whether we want to pursue faith or not. Faith does not just happen to you. I wish it was that easy. It's something we pursue or we don't. 
We can choose to obey the kind of wisdom that the Holy Spirit lays out for us in the Bible or not. And then maybe the biggest one is we choose when the Holy Spirit communicates that there's something in my life that's in direct violation to the healthy ways that God has set out for me to live, we call that sin, that when there's something in my life that violates the nature of God, I always have an option to repent. And it's the Holy Spirit who makes that available to me every moment of the day. It kind of all sums in this one verse in Mark, in Mark 1.15, it says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. He's right here. Repent and believe in the gospel. And that's it. That's how we relate to the Holy Spirit of God. We admit the places that we are not healthy and we ask for another chance. And he always gives it to us because that's who he is. Now, when you read the Bible, you will recognize that to, be, to understand who the Holy Spirit is and to relate to him is not an experience that where the goal is, okay, then I won't have to really go through the suffering anymore. And, and to really read the Bible, you see that the Holy Spirit is not the dispenser of all the good things you want in life. This is not like having a spiritual bodyguard. Like, oh, if I'm close to the Holy Spirit, he'll block the really bad things. And it's not like a spiritual Santa Claus, where if I do a really good job, I can submit a list and maybe I'll get the top three things. Those ideas, I've heard them, but I've never found them in the Bible. What we have is the opportunity to relate to the actual Holy Spirit of God. When we are confused, when we are terrified, when it's the scariest moment or when it's the most beautiful moment that you can't believe is your actual real life. That's what we have. We have the opportunity to relate to the Holy Spirit in all of that. So here's something for you to consider. If the Holy Spirit of God, his presence on this earth is near, and if he can communicate with people, then the Holy Spirit of God can communicate with me. And he can communicate with you. So when I pray, and when I read my Bible, in how, it does not have to be long, but when I read my Bible, when I pray, what I am doing is I am leaving open spaces for the Holy Spirit of God to communicate to me through what I'm reading in the Bible, or I pray when I walk, when I'm outside, I leave those spaces for the Holy Spirit to communicate to my heart. I leave the spaces for him to provide the guidance or the assurance that comes from him. So I was in a meeting, I told you I teach third grade, I was in a meeting for one of my kids who is phenomenal and handsome and funny and reading is not going well. So we had done a series of assessments and we were all sitting together, the whole team, to analyze his errors and to try to figure out where is the greatest weakness that we can target with the best intervention to help him make the progress quickly. And in those meetings, I always try to sit next to the speech and language therapist because it has come to my attention 14 years in that they are usually the smartest person in the room. I don't know what they do in their undergrad or graduate programs, but they know things, the speech and language teachers, but they also tend to not be show-offs. So you have to sit next to them to hear, hear all their good ideas. So I sit next to my SLP whenever we go to these meetings, and she said, I think that we should give this little boy a hearing assessment. And I said, oh no, Lori, he can hear me. And she said, honey, everyone can hear you. That's not how we decide who gets a hearing assessment. <laughs> She was like, actually, when we looked at his data, he's dropping all of his word endings. He's dropping them when he talks. He's dropping them in his writing. And he's not um, reading them out loud. You know, the E-D-I-N-G-E-S. And she said that um, when we put those suffixes on, when we put the word endings on, our voices uh, are at a different frequency and they're harder to hear we speak the root of the word louder than we do the ending. And she was like, I just think we need to look to see if he can hear that frequency. And that um, made me think that that's a lot like 
hearing the Holy Spirit. It is on a different frequency. And when we learn to come to the Bible to get information, and when we learn to pray and listen, we learn over time to hear on that frequency, to hear the Holy Spirit of God speak to us and guide us and assure us. I'll give you an example of this. Remember I said that um, people learn best through pictures. And so when we talk about visions, it's not woo-woo, it's just pictures. And um, several years ago, I was struggling with the concept of the cross and the crucifixion. Because to me, it felt unnecessarily violent and cruel. What kind of God? And I brought it repeatedly in my prayer times. I brought that to my prayer times and just honestly told God how uncomfortable it made me and how much I didn't like that that was how he had chosen to save humanity and how I kind of struggled to associate with a faith that was grounded in that kind of a moment. And one of those days as I was praying, I saw like a quick picture in my mind, one second, and I understood immediately what the picture meant and that it was for me. And I imagined the inside of an operating room and a patient under um, the knife for an open heart surgery. And do you realize what a horrendously violent action an open heart surgery is? One human being cuts open another human being in the most vulnerable and crucial part of their body. And there's blood everywhere, and it's horrible and traumatic, and then they keep cutting, presumably, I'm not a doctor, and, and even the recovery from that is horrible. Some people who go through open heart surgery say, I'm not doing that again, because you're so weak and it's so difficult to regain your strength and it's so risky. What kind of doctor would do something that violent? Why would anyone do that to another person? It's because it's the only way to save their life. What kind of God would allow that kind of pain and violence into his own existence. One who wanted to save our life. That's what he's like. So um, there's an, a pastor and author named A.W. Tozer who wrote, I don't want the world to define God for me. I want the Holy Spirit to reveal God to me you can find out who God is and you can hear him speak to you. So the music people are going to come back out and I'm going to give you homework because this is what I do for a living. Um, I want you to save a few minutes each day this week. So consider your week and consider where you can fit your few minutes. A few minutes each day to build the kind of muscles and skills that will help you hear the Holy Spirit speak. So that's a couple minutes with your Bible because that is often how he speaks to us. It's a couple minutes praying and listening so that you leave the space and you build the habits that allow the Holy Spirit of God to talk to you. And he can talk to you through the Bible. He can talk to you through nature. He can give you an image or a memory. He can talk to you through a friend. He's not limited the way we're limited. And I'm also gonna give you time to start your homework because my eight-year-olds insist so that's very helpful. So they're gonna play quietly for a couple minutes and here's my encouragement. Take the thing that bothers you the most right now. The thing that makes you sad or scared. Whatever your biggest emotion is right now, bring that and tell it to the Holy Spirit. Leave a little space and do that every day for a week so that you start to develop the kind of frequency because he really is that good and he really will talk to you. I'm not gonna tell you what he's saying to you because he can tell you that for himself.